Hello, hello, hello. Happy Tuesday. Um, happy day after Valentine's Day. I hope you all um, had a chance to spend time with people that you love, whether they be friends or significant others or our family. Um, I, I, one of uh, the Hummingbird team members shared with me yesterday, uh, his name is uh, JD. Uh, JD said that uh, uh, many of his friends have redefined Valentine's Day as a day for love and friendship. And I, I loved that. So I hope you all had a beautiful, beautiful Valentine's Day. I am uh, delighted to uh, to be here for Hummingbird Hour. Um, we are um, kicking off the, the Hummingbird Hour, um, uh, sort of getting the train going again, as it were, as it were uh, with uh, last month we had Latanya Wilkins with us. Um, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Jennifer Brown and Rohit Bhargava. Um, to talk about their book Beyond Diversity. So um, let's let's just talk through about a, a, a bit about uh, what's coming up, um, and I'll do some introductions, and then we'll we'll come back to our our special guests. So next month I am delighted, delighted, delighted that we'll be joined by Betty Ng, uh, who's the author of Polling Power. Uh, Betty and I actually, I think, met through the the Jennifer Brown community calls, uh, which is uh, which was a big. Uh, a big start for my journey in the DEI space or another step in my, my journey in the DEI space. Um, and I made so many wonderful connections there. So delighted to, to invite Betty uh, to share about her book, book Polling Power. Um, so, but today we have wonderful, two wonderful guests with us, Jennifer Brown, who I'm sure many of you will already know and love, uh, is an international best-selling speaker and author and consultant in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And she has um, a book um, uh, out that I use uh, as a reference tool for a lot of the programs we do at Hummingbird Humanity around inclusive leadership. Um, so I'm sure we'll share those uh, those links in the chat. Um, and uh, and I think you know there's some some great uh, references uh, in that book that uh, certainly ignite um, great conversation and dialogue and thinking about being an inclusive leader and a human centered leader. And then we also have. Rohit Bhargava, who is the um, author of Non-Obvious Megatrends, um, like another book that many of you may be familiar with. And, um, and we're gonna probably talk about some of those megatrends today as well. So with that, let's kick off the conversation. And uh, Jennifer, um, oh, I'm sorry, we're here to talk about Beyond Diversity. Did I, hopefully I mentioned that already. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're here to talk about Beyond Diversity. Um, and uh, I actually, uh, before we before I go into the question I was just about to ask, um, Jennifer, I saw a post from you recently that there's a hidden message here on the cover. Would you would you tell us about the hidden message and what what it's all about? <laughs> yes, I have to give credit to Rohit on this one, but um, I don't know if everybody sees it. We got to see it to be it. That's a little clue. So if you see that we embedded be it in the design and uh, let me let Rohit actually share a little bit more about the cover design because it was something that was very, very intentionally done. Yeah, we, uh, unlike many of the cover designs that, that uh, maybe we've done in the past where we just got a cover designer in this one, we were lucky enough to commission a unique piece of mosaic art, which is what you'll see behind the letters from an artist named Zaria Shin who's uh, amazing and has done a bunch of different mosaic pieces. And so we worked with her to develop these mosaics, which she actually kind of hand did. So it's not just like digitally created. Somebody actually created the mosaics and then scanned them in. And then we used those for the letters and did the whole cover concept around that. So there's a kind of a whole backstory behind that, but we just love the hidden message, but also just the bright, colorful, hopefully welcoming sense of design that you get from this cover. and. As, as an introduction into what the book's really about. I, I will say it is eye grabbing. It grabbed my attention when I first saw it. So, um, and, and uh, as having a book coming out myself later this year, I know I'm like, how do we make the book stand out from the other books in the bookshop? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Um, <laughs> and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful message. So Lindsay, I'm gonna let you finish your, your slide of sharing duties and join uh, the conversation um, with the, the group of attendees. Um, thank you so much for, for helping us. Uh, get get off to a great start here. So first of all, Rohit and Jennifer, I, I want to ask a question. Um, of course, I shared a couple highlights from your 
bios, which certainly does not do either of you justice in your careers. Um, but I'm curious, would you share something um, in the spirit of let's be humans together, something that maybe people wouldn't know from your bios, uh, something that uh, might be a, a unique aspect of your life? Mm, you go first, Rohit. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what we agreed you were going to take all the difficult ones first and now you're going off script uh let's see something in my language non-obvious about me uh well people probably know this about jennifer already her musical background but i have a, a slight musical background uh, myself i'm a drummer and uh interestingly enough i found drumming to be great practice for what I talk about now, which is like curating different ideas and, and putting pieces together to see the future. Because what drummers do is they have limb independence. My right hand, my left hand, my right foot, my left foot can all do something different at the same time, because that's how you play a drum set. And that's a good analogy, I think, for what we all have to do in our lives and in business right now, which is kind of juggle multiple things and be able to do them at once. So that whole like, you know, pat your head and like, you know, tummy thing, like that's easy for a drummer. <laughs> Well, you know, and that reminds, I've been having this debate with my sister recently about whether we can actually multitask or whether we, or whether we have to be present for what's happening in the moment. Um, and they're like, you just gave the argument for the, the, the multitasking is a real thing. Cause I always tell her you can't do the two things at the same time. <laughs> it's a, it's a real thing, but not for deep work. Right. <laughs> Good point. Depends. I mean, I can multitask and watch the Olympics and uh, pay my finances uh, and bills at the same time. And that is easy. But, you know, writing is not a multitasking mm. thing. Like you got to turn off the internet and write. Absolutely. That's the truth. That's agreed. The truth. Agreed. What about you, Jennifer? <laughs> Thanks, Rohit, for going first. Gave me a second to think. Uh, well, I don't get to talk about my partner, Michelle, very much, but I'm um, she's Filipina American first generation. And so I'm part of a, a giant Filipino multi-generational family. And she's also an animal rights. We met as activists in our 20s. And so uh, I have this wonderful exposure to uh, baby farm animals and, and rest farm you know, animal rescue and you know veganism, which I aspire to, I cannot claim. Uh, but the just that what that has brought to our lives is is so refreshing and inspiring and um, just like soul filling and so dramatically different than um, than what we you know we focus on every single day. But interestingly, a field that actually has some DEI work to do as well. In fact, there's a new report out on on DEI in the animal <laughs> rights world, which has has some work to do. Um, so anyway, we don't need to get into that, but, uh, it's been neat to see that community kind of wake up to the same conversations that we've been having too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and I, I'm sure that we could, we could probably spend the next hour on the, um, what are the industries and arenas that have not yet, um, or are just embarking on the DEI journey? Uh, we have, uh, at Hummingbird have, a uh, the, have the opportunity to start working with some of the Broadway producers and that's been really interesting um so uh, i won't take us there right now either but i would you know th there's so much to explore so before we talk about beyond diversity uh you two as i understand met at the beyond diversity summit um and that was where this idea ignited would you share a little bit about the what it was like to meet and how did you come up with the idea for this book do you know, so I, I just, get, I throw it out there. Should I ask? I'm like, I'm going to say, but, no. <laughs> let's do Rohit on that one. <laughs> no, I think, I think, yeah, you might, you might want to, you might want to direct it. Otherwise we're both talkers. So we'll just jump straight in. Yeah, that's um, true. And I don't think that's necessarily what you want. You know, so. Jennifer, I think that Rohit went first last time. So I think okay. it's okay. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> so yeah. So the Beyond Diversity Summit was where Rohit and I originally collaborated and um, it was a five day, 200 speaker multi-track, very, very broadly diversified in terms of topics and speakers and identities and global. And uh, so it just was this endeavor to broaden the lens with which we see this topic. And um, I moderated a panel on DNI and tech, I believe, with Natalie Egan and a couple other amazing uh, trailblazers. And um, it, there was just so much good content that that was pulled together. And we thought, we, you know, th this is a book. It has to be a book. You know, it has to be in a format that can be easily passed around and accessible and digestible for the world. 
um, that doesn't, maybe doesn't think about these things very much. And so we decided to do that. And it was, um, it was really tough to be constrained by the number of pages that are in a book and, and have all this amazing content. And the writing process was um, a challenging one and one that I'd never been through before, which was all of this original source material that had to be categorized and, you know, tough choices made around what fit and, and also the diversity of stories that we included um, needed to be as complete as possible also. So, you know, it was a very, um, it was a different writing process than I'm used to, but we're really proud of it because I think, you know, we succeeded, I think, in making something so readable and um, making those really difficult choices. But at some point through it, it felt like it was sort of a mountain of stuff and we didn't not want to leave anything on the yeah. cutting room floor. <laughs> yeah, that was the tough thing. I mean, we had so many voices uh, from the summit and when you have 200 speakers who are all not really DEI people. I mean, we had uh, folks who might self-describe themselves that way and say, look, I spent all day, every day working in the field of DEI. But we also had people who were, look, my, you know, we would say my job is a casting director. And as part of a casting director's job, I want to think about how to diversify roles, but that's not my, no. that's not my job. My job is to find the best person for, for all the roles. And my intent is to try and make that as diverse as possible. And so we had so many people like that, whose work touched the world of DEI, but who weren't necessarily DEI people. And that's one of the things that I think Jennifer and I both uh, really gravitated towards from our backgrounds too, because I've never described myself as a DEI person. I spend most of my time talking about innovation and strategy and trends. And that was the world that I was coming from. And then to pair with Jennifer and all of her deep knowledge on, you know, really all these things that huge companies are dealing with when it comes to setting their ambitions towards DEI, putting those worlds together was really valuable for us because there were, there were blind spots that I had in terms of what I didn't know. And there was definitely the same for, for Jennifer, I think. And then bringing in, if you look at the cover of the book, you might've noticed that besides my name and Jennifer's name, we also had six other people's names on the front cover. And that's also intentional because we had six other contributors who were bringing their perspectives as well. I love that we're in this chapter in our in our world um, uh, that we're paying attention and learning from each other in different ways. You know, Rohit, you mentioned that you know that there were some learning moments for you in this you know in this journey. I, I'm curious, what has been um, the biggest aha for you, or the biggest? I wish I would have known this before. <laughs> And the, you know, I'm I'm going to make an assumption that the last two years, uh, for the two of you, have been similar to me of a huge learning curve. Um, and there are some things that uh, that I wish I'd known. And and actually, I'll share one of mine just to to go first. Is you know, I was an HR person for many years and helped. Um, uh, analyze and theme out the results from employee engagement surveys um, more times than I can count. And what I realize uh, looking back with what the, the lens that I have today is that we always sanitized out any individuality in those assess those analyses. Uh, we identified how does this composite group feel, whether it was a team or a department or a function or a, you know, a population of employees, but we didn't look at the unique experiences of those individuals. And I, I'm like, I wonder what we really missed because um, I'm sure we missed a lot and I missed a lot in those in that approach. So I'm grateful to say I don't do it that way anymore. Um, but that's, you know, that's been one of the, the big learnings for me in the last couple of years of the importance of looking at the experiences of different individuals through different identity lenses. What, 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 what's what been the, the big learning for you? I think, it's, is it Rohit, Rohit's turn to go first? Yes, uh, we're, we're, we'll, we're, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna try to keep it fair on this call. So. <laughs> That's uh, that's total equity. I, I, I like that. Um, I'd say my big learning probably is that there are more places where I can personally have an impact on how diversity, equity, and inclusion is practiced in the places I go uh, than I realized before. And it was easy for me to think, I mean, I'm a business owner, I hire people. So the easy thing to, to consider is, am I hiring as diversely and as inclusively as I could? But what I would forget about is I would go to an event where I'm the keynote speaker and I would show up and uh, I would have a role to play in terms of being able to make the rest of that event 
as diverse and inclusive as possible, but only if I take the initiative to do it, right? It's very easy as a keynote speaker to get booked for an event, not pay attention to anyone else who's going to be on stage because like you're the, you know, you're the keynote. And so you end up showing up at the event. You have no idea who else is speaking there. You haven't actually talked to the event organizers proactively about whether their stage is diverse or not. And that's a missed opportunity. And I never really thought like that before I kind of thought, okay, you know, as long as my message is diverse and what I'm saying is inclusive and I'm participating, like that's, that's my role. Uh, I'm not organizing the event, right? It's not like, as if it's my event, but my, my mental shift and my perception shift through writing this book became, you know, it doesn't have to be my job in order for me to actually be able to have an impact. If I proactively go and ask some really uh, specific questions. Who else is on stage? Have you considered these other individuals that I know who would be great on stage, but maybe aren't part of your set of people that you've been thinking about uh, for whatever reason? So I realized that there's more that I could be doing uh, if I were more proactive about it. So that was probably one of my big learnings. Well, and it's a great way to be, to demonstrate allyship as well um, of how do I, uh, you know, because you have a role of privilege in that role, in that uh, position as being a keynote, and how do you um, uh, just engage in the conversation to be an ally for others whose voices may not be, have been included in consideration. Um, I know Jennifer and I've had some of those conversations over in recent years of how she thinks about who's going to be on a panel with her and, uh, um, and, you know, and whether she gives up, you know, give up your seat, Jennifer, or whether you're saying, Hey, we need to really rethink the, the makeup of this panel, or we need to invite some of these voices to the conversation. That's right. In fact, I just got a request for pride podcast guests for June. And the person said, of course, we'd love to have you, but I was ready with a list of not me <laughs> that featured a lot of voices that I have been investing in so that I'm ready for those requests. I'm ready. I'm more than ready. I'm like, oh gosh, here's 20 and I have 20 more, you know, uh, but I'm really, I'm proud of that because I've invested deeply in that. And, and I'm also, I have, but you have to be secure enough. You can't be coming from the scarcity place to say like, I have to grab this opportunity. You know, it has to be this generosity and sort of taking your hands off the wheel and leading from behind that it has a different energy to it. So, um, but I think that's something we can all do more of. I would say, Brian, the really neat thing that I learned and uh, have deepened my commitment to through this process is we hired um, inclusivity readers, um, also known as sensitivity readers to go through the book. And Rohit tells the story of what, what happened when we discovered that, for example, we used about, I think, 12 people um, for different parts of the book because we, want, we wanted all those lived experiences. You know, it wasn't just good enough to have one lens because we all know our lenses are limited. Even sensitivity readers' lenses are limited. Um, but we also discovered there was a pay gap in terms of the pricing they were quoting us between each other. And it was an opportunity to practice what we preach. And I give Rohit credit because he was in the driver's seat at that moment um, and said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to take the highest paid hourly and I'm going to make that a benchmark and I'm going to communicate to everybody that this is what they're going to get. <laughs> and so we had this like mini lesson for ourselves and a reminder of how powerful whenever you like Rohit just said, when you are in the driver's seat and have the ability to make these choices, you can you, even even if you think you, oh, I, what could I do with the pay gap? Well, you can do a lot. It's these little yeah. examples of it. And, um, and I think we really shifted yeah. how they think about themselves in the market, their value. I hope confidence, you know, we've all, we've all underquoted. I mean, I don't know, Rohit, if you have stories about that, I know I've underquoted and, and it's, been, it's like hit me in sure, the face, yeah. you know, and been like, oh, how could I have done that? But, um, but somebody put me in a position then of, of sort of not telling me what something was going to be compensated at and then I underbid which is very as we know gendered and you know there are other things about that so it's such a lesson to keep learning that I think we can also affect other people's lives in really concrete ways in this way yeah Rohit did I did I capture that accurately <laughs> yeah 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 I mean I think the the most gratifying thing is to hope that once someone gets a certain amount from you know a, a publisher I mean the 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 book Beyond Diversity was published by Idea Press, which is a company that I founded with my wife and I. So we're also the publishers of the book. Yeah. And so here's a real publisher going to these sensitivity readers and saying, look, what you're worth and what we're going to pay you is this amount. Our hope was that they would take that and say, oh, there was a publisher willing to pay me X. And so that's what I should be charging people. <laughs> um, 
So it's beyond just getting paid well for one job. Hopefully we give them the confidence to say, look, that's what the rate is. So now that's what they hopefully charge moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and and I I know inherent in what we're what we, you're both sharing, and I know this is true for how I try to lead um, my you know my team and my business is uh, you know my job is to challenge CEOs and leaders and decision makers to make these the types of decisions that you're both talking about, and I want to be able to say if they turn around and say, well, do you do it at your business? Yep, I do, and here's some examples, and I want to walk the talk as well. Um, so, is that are we authentic and and how we're um, championing for change? Um, you know, so let's talk about how change happens a little bit, just in that spirit of championing for change. You know, something that I know um, I'm delighted to see is that. Um, we, we seem to have, um, so let me just acknowledge that I realize there's always going to be some unopened doors that we still have to sort of, you know, knock open or, 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 um, or kick open if it were, uh, but you were seeing that the, the one, one and done diversity training uh, uh, time period seems to be passed, hopefully, uh, where there's just the one two hour workshop and uh, we're like, oh, good, we, we're good now. We're all diverse and inclusive and equitable here. We're trained. Uh, <laughs> we're trained and we're good to go. Um, so, you know, gold stars and all that. So, um, you know, and I know that, you know, what I'm, what I'm seeing, and I think this is true for, for how you thought about the book is what, what is, is emerging as a uh, recognition that we need to have dialogue and discussion. Like we're not going to learn all the things. Like I'm never going to have all of the knowledge about all of the different lived experiences that I need to have. I'm every day I'm learning something new. Um, and so then it's you know, the way that I've been thinking about it is it's a skill set. It's a it's a it's an ability to have critical thinking and to interrogate and to understand and to be open to sensitive conversations. And I know that that played into how you how you crafted this book. Do you want to talk a little bit about about that? Um, and Rohit, I think it's your turn. I'm not sure. I've lost. I've lost score. But we're just going to go with you anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think that. I think it was. I mean, one of the things that we did very intentionally from the beginning of the process was we took the title of the book to heart of going beyond diversity, because for us, what that meant was that we were going to talk about diversity in every dimension, including the dimensions that often are missed in conversations about diversity. So ageism, for example, um, is often not talked about in conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, even though there are people who are getting discriminated against either by being because they are too old for a, considered too old for a situation or too young. Um, and so they're discriminated against based on their age. And that's kind of across genders and across uh, ethnicities. So we wanted to talk about that. We wanted to talk about disabilities, um, but we didn't want to segment people in such a way where we would write a book and say, okay, here, chapter one is about disability. And chapter two is for people, uh, people who are, uh, who've been discriminated against because of age. And chapter three is for this ethnicity. Uh, we didn't want to organize things that way because too often what we've seen in the world of DEI is, that's how conferences are organized. That's how events are organized. That's how books are written. Uh, and we wanted to go beyond that and say that there are ways that we can talk about uh, topics that affect all of us and do it across all of these different categories. And so when you look at the structure of, of this book, it's got 12 themes. And each one of the themes are human themes. So for example, storytelling, technology, education, government, uh, identity, culture, family. I mean, these are things that are not based on your gender or based on your ethnicity or age. These are things that affect all of us. Uh, and that's how we wanted to try and talk about diversity because we felt that that was the really inclusive way of doing it. And, and as, you, as you dive in here, Jennifer, I'm also curious why storytelling was first. Oh, well, you know, I mean, it all starts with the, with the personal, right? The, the, uh, the power of our stories to shift systems around us and also shift the way that we believe in ourselves in those systems, right? The way that we can activate ourselves. So for Rohit and me, we really, we wanted to lead with that because it captures the heart and mind in this unique way that sticks with us and stays with us. And, you know, which stories and which identities aren't being elevated, you know, it was it, to us, it was walking the talk and making sure that we started with that, with that discipline um, of elevating it. And we needed to share our own stories too, 
Rohit's and mine, right? To orient the reader and why us, like why this book, why us, like why are we the ones that want to put this together and what is our, our purpose? So I, I think that um, it framed the rest of the book really beautifully. And, um, you know, and we want a new generation of storytellers to be elevated and new lived experiences and intersectionalities of storytellers to be elevated too. Um, and we knew that, I think we knew that, that it would capture the early reader and make sure that they stuck with, you know, that they really got excited about sticking with the rest of the book. But I, I would love to hear Rohit's answer too, because, you know, you're all about stories too, Rohit, um, you know, and, and how they pertain to like really making a book come alive and feel very personal at the same time as it feels like a great resource. Yeah, I mean, I most of my career I spent in the world of marketing and advertising, uh, and that's really the business of persuasion. Um, and sometimes people use it for evil reasons to persuade you to buy something that's going to make you less healthy or, you know, make you feel more adequate, even though you shouldn't need it. Uh, but in many cases, it is persuasion for 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 good things too. And it all starts with storytelling. I mean, center to great marketing and advertising is storytelling because that's how we are persuaded as humans. And so storytelling was a natural place to start a book about a topic like this because that's how we were going to engage people. And if you kind of dig through the book or start flipping through some of the different chapters, you'll see that everything is filled with stories. I mean, we don't take an academic approach to this topic. We take a story-driven approach. Mm -hmm. And so because we had so many speakers at the summit, because we wanted to bring their stories into it, the book is really filled with us talking about examples. It's one example after another. It's one story after another. It's you know, in business language, it's, it's to some degree one case study after another. I mean, that's really the approach that we took to try and bring all of these lessons to life. We wanted to tell them through the real stories of people, entrepreneurs, businesses, examples that that maybe you hadn't heard before. And I know, Rohit, as we were talking just uh, before today's conversation, you mentioned that one of your hopes, um, at yours and Jennifer's, I'm sure, was that this book and the, the, the messages would ignite conversation or spark conversation. Um, can you share more about what that what that hope is and what it what and what you hope that sort of means on the other side of those conversations? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, uh, Jennifer and I are about to put together a sort of mini session uh, for another event. And they asked us, what do you want to talk about? Uh, we'll give you five minutes. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> and you could probably already tell from having listened to Jennifer and I that giving either one of us five minutes. Five minutes is not enough time. No. <laughs> no, it's not enough time. Um, but the one thing we did know is, well, we only really have time to answer one question. So let's make it a juicy one. And the question we landed on, which I think is totally relevant to the question you just asked, is why is diversity so hard to talk about? Mm. Because it is a tough topic. I mean, it feels like a loaded topic. It feels like that conversation, especially in a business context, that we just don't want to have. Mm. Uh, because partially, I think the first reason why we, we naturally shy away from it, most people do, even DEI people. Um, shy away from it is because we feel like the first thing we have to do is justify why we should even have an opinion about it in the first place because of the things that we aren't. Um, I'm not a woman. So should I even be talking about uh, anything related to women, right? Uh, that's the first natural impulse that any of us have to justify why we should have an opinion in the first place because of what we aren't. And it's a defensive way to go into a topic that is really important. And what we wanted to try and do, especially through stories, but, but even just through the entire book, was to say to people, this needs to be talked about, um, and it doesn't always have to be this difficult, loaded conversation. Um, the only way to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion isn't to focus your entire conversation on racism. That's one aspect. Uh, but there are other elements to this conversation that we should all talk about, about how to create a more inclusive world. And so the way we wrote the book and the fact that at the end of every chapter, we have these really uh, thoughtfully broken out lists of what you can do, what needs to change in society and conversation starters. We have entire online resources, which I know you're going to share with the audience through uh, 
through the chat and, and afterwards with links to conversation starting questions. And we have like a whole PDF uh, presentation with like more than 70 of these interesting questions that you can use to start a conversation, whether it's in a book club or an employee resource group or inside of the university context for like uh, classes and courses. Really what we wanted to try and do is like spark that conversation by giving people entry points. Uh, and that's what you'll find throughout the book, these entry points to be able to have that conversation in a way that doesn't feel like you're putting everyone on the spot or that everyone feels like they need to defend themselves going into it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, and uh, I really appreciate the um, hi you highlighting the um, the reality that, I, you know, and the way that I'll put it in the words that I often um, say is, we, we all have to have these conversations now and none of us were taught how to have them. Um, and, you know, we have to have these sensitive, emotional, real conversations. And many of us were told to be colorblind and we're like, well, that's not the way the world is. So we have to have conversations about color now and race and ethnicity, but we were told not to talk about it and not to see it for most of our lives. So how do we have that conversation and many other examples around you know the experiences of different gender you know gender identities or queer individuals or you know and uh, you know, people with disabilities and so on so um I, you know i think it's uh it is a skill set and a a muscle that so many of us don't have um that that you know have, have flexed and you know i i know i'm always still learning every day and and so some days i still get it wrong and i like and i'm grateful for those people who say hey Brian, maybe there's another way to think about this. So Jennifer, I, I know, you know, being, you know, Jennifer, Rohit, you may know this, but Jennifer has been one of my mentors for a number of years and I'm incredibly grateful. And, you know, these, uh, these, these are some of the things I know I've learned from Jennifer about, you know, just being gracious in those moments of learning. So, mm -hmm. you know, Jennifer, as you think about the, the messages here and those conversations we need to have and our commitments to driving change, what, what are some things that sort of emerge for you as you think about the messages of the book? Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of each chapter, I think Rohit alluded to this, but the we have this like rubric at the end that's very practical and applicable right away, which is like what needs to happen, which is the systems question, right? We want readers to come through that chapter and say, okay, so what's the change that's needed? What's the problem or the gap or the opportunity, right? Um, and then what can I do? And then the conversation starters are the language. Um, and so I agree with this, with both of you that we're, it's, it's, we're, we're having to use a new language we have never learned. Um, and even within the LGBTQ community, I mean, Brian with, with gender pronouns and making sure those, those are confirmed and checked and then, and then articulated consistently is, is still in, for some of us, even within a community, new learning and new language and new discipline. So I do, um. I, I'm really proud of that part of the book, and I'm actually adopting it in my second edition of my my next. Um, I'm doing a second edition of my book, my previous book, and at the end of each chapter, I really want to land the plane. I really want to, you know, not let people give people the checklist they want. You know, even though we resist that, I think sometimes because mm -hmm. we want people to kind of do the work themselves. But I do think in such a rapidly shifting landscape, we do have to boil it down. We do have to say, this is what good looks like. Here's where you can start and here's what it sounds like. Um, but I, uh, I agree, people are very, they're very stuck. Um, generationally, I think some of us struggle relatively more because we have that lack of lived experience, both in ourselves, uh, particularly in leadership of organizations, but also around us, just the proximity to difference is lacking not just in our workplaces, but in our communities, et cetera. So, you know, can the book, can the book bring some of these lived experiences to be closer to us? You know, can it, can it leave us with a feeling of having spent some time with a storyteller, spent some time with a, you know, an entrepreneur that's really broken through? Um, I hope, I hope so. And we also have videos actually of the entire conference too. So it's not even in the, just the pages it's in, it's in the footage. And um, I think that a lot of us who are trying to increase the, the diversity around us need to seek out media and, you know, however we learn and gather information, whatever our preferred method is, you know, proximity and frequency is so important to begin to, to broaden our lens and it starts there. And then ideally it moves forward to, do I actually know someone with this lived experience? I'm not just reading about them. I'm not just watching a show about them. They're actually in my life. And then the next iteration of it is, do we have a trusted relationship where 
that person can actually give me feedback and vice versa. And we can have that flexibility and resiliency in our, in our, in, in trust where we can be honest with each other about how we're impacting each other. And that's then the application of what we might learn on the pages or, and so we, there's just these gates that we go through as, as learners. And um, I feel so fortunate to now, I hope that the, the invitation's always open in our network and mine to give us feedback and Rohit, we've gotten some already on some of the stuff in the book too, right? Like a few sort of turns of phrase that, Mm -hmm. that somebody found problematic and it's such an opportunity to go deep into the topic and kind of learn and research and say, huh, so how, how might we have termed that differently? We went through a whole thing on capitalize, whether or not to capitalize the word white. And Mm -hmm. we, we learned so much in the exploration of that. We ended up deciding to capitalize it. And um, we talk about why actually in the book, and I won't I, I, you have to read the book to find out, <laughs> we, but we do talk about our sources. We do talk about who we consulted. Um, but I really, I was transformed by that, that digging process. Um, it, it deepened and widened my understanding of, boy, the importance of language. So, you know, all we can do really, even those of us who talk about this all the time is just share how the sausage is being made in ourselves. Like not having any fear to say like, here's a learning I had recently. Here's something that I might not have gotten right, but what I learned and how I'm trying to incorporate and what I may still get wrong. And I I just love, if we had more leaders kind of role modeling that, that would create a lot of safe space and psychological safety, I think, to learn in public. But, you know, our world doesn't have a lot of tolerance for that (laughs) these days. So (laughs) not sure. Not sure uh, there, there is a risk to it, but if you're not uncomfortable, you're not leading, Brian, as you've heard me say a million times. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and you know, the, you, you st- started to step into that space of, you know, there's a, you know, one, one of the problematic aspects of um, most organizational cultures is this desire for or expectation of perfection, which mm. we all know perfection is unattainable. Um, and yet we've, we've, conveyed messages that perfection is the goal and is the is the the barometer on which we'll be judged and what we expect to do as a leader and so then modeling vulnerability um, is is you know becomes challenging because it's it's counterintuitive to the messages we've learned along the way one of the things that that has happened um, in some of the spaces I've had the the privilege to to be part of um, and a facilitator is, working with groups of leaders who are figuring out how to model vulnerability and figuring out how to have some of these conversations. Um, and what I've seen um, is, uh, uh, is that they'll come back and they'll take the conversations to their back to their families, to their kids, to their parents, to their significant others. And then they'll bring back those examples to, uh, uh, to the, the spaces that we're in together. Um, one, one of my, you know, one of my favorite stories is a, uh, a, a woman who's an executive leader who has a three-year-old son um, who decided that he likes to dress up in princess dresses. Um, and she was really struggling with it um, and was sort of, and you know, she's in this space. She's like, I'm in this space right now where I'm learning how to break those norms and those perspectives. And yet I don't think my son should be wearing princess dresses. And um, and her, and she shared with us uh, through some tears uh, in, the, in the group we were in that she said, my husband was the one who said, who cares <laughs> if he wants to wear princess dresses, let him wear princess dresses and just let him be the beautiful human he is. Um, and I love that story in that moment. Um, and that's just one of many. And, you know, the reason I mentioned this is, you know, one of your chapters is on, inf- is, is about family and uh, this, the DEI and family, which I don't think is one of the things that we generally think of when we say the, the acronym DEI. Um, and, uh, of course, I know some really diverse families in my unit, in my in my world, and in my universe. Um, I'm sure you both do as well. So, tell tell us a little bit more about the 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 family aspect of of and the chapter on family. Jennifer, I'm, I think it's your turn. You got to go first this time. My turn. Oh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I um, gosh, we see this being so challenged in just to pick the workplace lens. Um, you know the, how family needs and priorities have not been resourced and supported by employers, you know, and, you know, how many, for example, millions of women left the workforce, you know, uh, I think it was last year or the fall of 2020, I think were those really eye-popping numbers. Um, And, 
you know, it's such a, it's such a tragedy and, and it, it, there, there's nothing that kind of makes my blood boil as much as this topic, because that the, to lose generations of talent in a workplace, because the workplace wasn't built by and for, and to work for so many of us <clears throat> so that we can optimize ourselves, right? Where we can give our best contributions. You know, it's frustrating to me that that's never been a priority. And then we had to pay this dear, dear price. Um, you know, that sets us back so far. So, uh, but on the flip side, you know, I love the parents um, to join you in your parent uh, story, Brian, the parents that say they come to this as all of a sudden I'm thrown into the deep end of the pool as an ally for my child. Um, you know, or I'm realizing that I'm really out of step and I don't want to be out of step. I want to be able to speak to my kids and relate to them. And so sometimes, oftentimes, I think, that the, the people in workplaces are also having that human experience where they really are craving what we're there to talk about. They're, you know, they, they want to have this fuller conversation about like what's happening in my family. And, you know, there's also political diversity happening in families and, and spiritual and religious diversity. And um, so uh, there's caregiving pressures, both up and down and, you know, everywhere. There's sandwich generation people who are managing elder care and also children. Um, so I, I think that this, this conversation is long overdue. Um, and, you know, that, that even our HR policies, Brian, as you know, because you were built, you were probably determining them for years, are so biased towards a heteronormative two-parent situation. <laughs> And have not taken into account how the family is changing. So, you know, again, this is one of those things I really want to bring to the fore, along with some other themes like mental health and others that have really not been adequately discussed or resourced or structured to help people, you know, bring their full self. You know, how can we bring our full self when we're managing all of these dynamics that that interrupt, you know, our ability to be productive and engaged, you know, that is a huge drag on the bottom line of any, of any system. So anyway, I was really excited about this chapter. I mean, Rohit, I know you also like really related to some of the words on the page on a personal level too. Um, I'll, I'll invite you to share what that chapter meant to you. Yeah. Well, and before you, yeah, do, this one, before yeah. you do Rohit, I just want to acknowledge one thing that Jennifer, you reminded me of is Mita Malik just posted an article she wrote in HBR about mm. uh, the need to change bereavement leaves because the definition of family has changed so much. Uh, so I just wanted to maybe Mark or Lindsay, if we can find that and share that in the chat, I would love to amplify that incredibly important message. It's one, it's a drum I've been beating because I mm -hmm. wanted to be a drummer, Rohit, and I didn't do it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a drum that I've been beating for many years and we got to change those those policies so um so sorry to interrupt you Rohit I I, I just wanted to make sure I amplified that message because I think it's an important one so tell us about your thoughts on the family chapter yeah it's uh I mean Jennifer mentioned that it was a deeply personal chapter and I think it, it was for for both of us um because family is personal right and and anytime you're writing about uh, family, you sort of see things from your perspective, you know, and I had, uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit of a chip on my shoulder when I went into writing this uh, <laughs> chapter, I think I can say, um, because I came from a, the wor a sort of working world where I was struggling with the, uh, the bias opposite of the uh, stay at home mom bias, which was the stay at work dad. You're expected to work a certain amount. If you say you want to take off any time to go and see your kids do anything, you're sort of looked at weird uh, because it's not supposed to be your thing. Like, can't your, can't your wife take care of that? Basically is what that look says to men in the workplace. And it's not fair to, um, to men who want to be there and, and be there for their kids and, uh, and be a shared parent. Um, and so I kind of came at it writing from, from that perspective uh, and also acknowledging that uh, men have had it pretty good. Uh, you know, we can get away with things that a lot of times moms in the workplace cannot get away with. Uh, and so should I even be complaining at all <laughs> was sort of something I had to struggle through in this chapter like this. When I think about family uh, or, or issues that have been faced by parents in the workplace or workplace discrimination against parents, it is hugely weighted towards women. So, you know, who am I to write about feeling biased towards me as a dad when I have everything, 
that I could possibly want in the, you know, in the perception of anyone else who might be reading, right? Uh, and so we had to kind of work through all of that, right? Because uh, just because one group is biased doesn't mean anyone else doesn't deserve to feel biased either, right? Uh, it's not like they're eating the entire pie and so there's none left for you. I mean, it's not that situation. And so we had to kind of, uh, with a joke, I think it's not a joke, actually, the joke is the wrong word, but the term that I'd heard uh, thrown around in the world of DEI, which was unfamiliar to me, but I'm sure you have heard is oppression Olympics. Um, and I didn't realize we were kind of doing an oppression Olympics thing by trying to outcompete one another for who felt biased. But I realized that a lot of that can come to the forefront when it, when you come to families, right? When you have a huge conversation about parenting in the workplace, people who don't have children feel excluded by that, even though they might be caregivers. And, you know, caregiving is basically what parenting is, right? But you may be caregiving for someone who's not a child. Uh, and so there's all these different dimensions to family. I mean, you think about adoptive families and, uh, and the difference between uh, what they get in terms of rights and, and legal rights, right? According to kind of the, the government uh, versus others and, and the struggle that's involved there. I mean, there's so many different dimensions to this that it really, this was one of those chapters that I think for anyone reading it, it should really open your mind to what family really actually means based on what you think family is versus what other people might, what might be important to other people. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, two stories that were in my mind. One of them just left, so we'll see if it comes back. But the the, fir the first one that I remember was I worked at one point in time. I was the the head of HR for a company in the Americas. I'll leave the name aside for the moment because they we had a policy that parents received two additional days off um, for to do things for their kids, and I um, was then and still am today single um, and. Uh, uh, and I'm like, I'm so glad we're doing something for parents, but this policy really angers me every time I have to say like, yes, of course you can take that time. Cause I'm like, I have people in my life that are important to me too, that I, I, yeah, I it's, you know, it was, it was a, it was a tough one um, yeah. that I, I really, really struggled with. Um, and uh, you know, and, and, oh, I know the other story I was going to share is, and yet, you know, to your you know point, Rohit, that, you know, this is a uh, parenting in particular is such a gendered conversation in the workplace that really needs to be right-sized for, for many, many reasons. Um, and I've, and I've, one of my learning moments was, um, you know, I, I, I have said more times than I can count to a woman with kids, I don't know how you do all the things. Um, and uh, one of those women shared with me once, but Brian, do you say that to the men who have kids? And I was like, you know, uh, unless they've just had a newborn and not, then my question is often, to both everyone, regardless of gender, do you, do you get any sleep? Like that's a, that one I can say is truly gender agnostic. Um, but I finally took that that um, uh, you know that phrase of like I don't know how you do it all um, out of my because I because out of my you know list of things to say, even in humor, because I was perpetuating a stereotype that's not helpful, um, and uh, and certainly is not you know the part being part of the change that I want to be part of. So um, always learning. Well, in the spirit of always learning, I want to ask a question. I'm, I have a, you know, I, I have a, you know, just knowing this work, we really, uh, this, the way that this work happens, when you work with someone on a project like this, you learn a lot about each other and from each other. Um, I'm curious to hear, is there something that you've really taken from each other, you know, each of you that was a, like, wow, I'm really glad I had this moment with Rohit and uh, Rohit, or you know, I had this moment with Jennifer. Um, Rohit, I think it's your turn, so you get to go mm. first. Yeah. Uh a lot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think probably where I'd start is um, I spent uh, in my twenties, I spent five years living in Australia, um, which is a very direct culture in terms of people saying what they're thinking uh, to the point where if you come from America, and especially if you come from growing up in the Washington DC area, which I think is fair to say is more politically correct than many other places uh, in America. Being in Australia is pretty shocking. Um, but once you get, get accustomed to that, coming back is even more shocking. And that's kind of what I did to myself. And so as a result of that, I think that I had learned 
through my time in Australia to have a very high threshold for getting offended. I don't get offended uh, pretty much at all by anything anyone says. Uh, I think certain things would be offensive uh, and I've gotten better at seeing what's offensive, but I personally don't get offended by a lot. And I think what I learned through the process of this book was uh, that the line for different people is very different. And it's not up to me to judge whether their line for being offended is way too low um, because different people set what they're offended by differently based on what their life experience has been. And I don't know what they've gone through up until that point to be offended by something that I thought was completely innocent. Uh, and I really had to, to think about that for myself because the temptation for any of us is to see the line for these sorts of things similarly to where we trace it for ourselves and maybe a little bit differently, but we all have that kind of bias. And my bias would have been towards not really, if I get, let someone offend me, I personally feel like, you know, I'm letting it get to me and I shouldn't. And that's not the way that a lot of people think. And I think what I learned uh, from, from Jennifer was to really um, understand people where they are instead of taking my own experience uh, right. into that. And, um, and I think that it's something that, that, I don't know if you're just naturally do that, Jennifer, but I think you've definitely trained yourself also having worked mm -hmm. in this world and, and having had so many different collaborative experiences with so many different people that, um, that it's a skill. It's a skill that you have. And I think that when, people talk to you or when you talk to people, like they see that, they see that empathy. And, and so that was uh, something that I think was, was really important in the type of work that you do, but also something that I could learn from uh, as we were collaborating. Thank you. That's so lovely, Rohit. Thanks. And, you know, I would say, I guess my appreciation is, and Brian, thank you for the question. We haven't been asked this actually, um, that watching you go through that process it is wonderful. Like that was very fulfilling for me as somebody who always needs more uh, cisgender men in my life that are learning, you know, and talking about their learning and willing to be challenged and um, open to shifting. And you're so fast to shift, like you aren't attached and it's so true, but that's one of the competencies like that, that disattachment and the objectivity um, that I wish for more leaders, um, particularly those that tend to get really protective about what's true for me and what I understand where I, whether I disagree or agree, you know, that disagree, agree binary that we get really stuck in. Um, I've seen you really like learn through the process and be like unattached and completely, not just willing, but like open and seeking a different way to look at things. Um, and, you know, we had to, we had to be very, you're right, that it is, um, it's something that's trained and practiced, uh, Rohit, in me, the sensitivity to it. And I still miss, I miss a lot too. Between you and me, we're missing a bunch. And I remember our writing team was so helpful for this too, that, you know, Karen Doms on my team would see something and say, hmm, yeah. I'm not sure the statistic really communicates what we, what we believe and, and, and the most inclusive message here. Um, you know, how can, can we pick something else? And, and so it is a discipline, but it is, it is, it, I think it is best accomplished with as many lenses on things as possible and, and a lack of what I might call fragility. If I can borrow Robin D'Angelo's word and use it differently, which is fragility, meaning, um, I'm going to protect what I think and my ego is involved and, um, you know, that I'm, I'm not going to kind of humble myself to how this might read for someone. And, and, and sometimes the questions are hard. Like we have, um, we mentioned a disabled gamer in page four. And I, um, it's something that we, we had heard there was some disagreement about language, um, even within the community with disabilities around people first language, but we use disabled gamer. And then lo and behold, somebody wrote us and said, hey, that's not people first language. Like that's not the way I'd like to be referred to. And I don't think you should do that, et cetera. And so, but just the row had the flexibility that we have. And I love that we're also happen to be working with the publisher, right? So <laughs> we can make these changes quickly. Yeah. Like how great is it to have total control to get things as right as we can 
and the willingness and to do whatever it costs too. It's never been an issue. Like we just, we're both just at this place where we can make those kinds of investments quickly and without any drama and without attachment with only the purpose of learning. Um, and so I just really appreciate having written a book like this with you because it's too important not to approach in that way. But um, if either one of us hadn't been aligned around that, I think we would have, um, we would have come up with a much less beautiful product. Yeah, for sure. Mm. I love that. Hmm. I want to echo what Rohit said about said about you, Jennifer. I fully agree. You you have always let me be wherever I am in the moment. Um, <laughs> um, and sometimes I was in places that were dark, <laughs> and mysterious, yes, um, and... thorny thickets of. <laughs> yes, well, but you know, we've this... all been there. We've yeah, been there. absolutely. And this journey is about learning and being uncomfortable, as as you know, we would all agree. If you're going to drive, if you want to be a part of change, that you got to you got to live through some discomfort. Um, and uh, Rohit, I, it sounds like you've already gain some great skills here. There's a, there's a tool that we, that we use, um, that I use and that we teach at Hummingbird. It's called practice the pause. Um, and we, we encourage people to run through five questions. Does it need to be said? Does it need to be said right now? Does it need to be said by me? Can I say it with care and respect and love if that, if that, that feeling is appropriate for that moment? Um, and can I say it in the way that the other person can, in a way that the other person can hear it? Um, so when I use those questions, that's my way of getting to that how do I let someone be where they need to be? Because a lot of times I'm like, just keep your mouth shut, Brian. <laughs> you don't need to say anything. It's okay. Um, and uh, and that's that that's been really it's added peace to my life, and it's I think allowed me to see other people and hear other people in a different way. So yeah. we are at the, the finish line. This uh, this went so quickly. Um, I wanted to ask you both if you can share how people can uh, can connect with you. So uh, Rohit, you get to go first this time. How how can people connect with you or follow you or learn from you uh, after this after today's Hummingbird Hour? Uh, so me personally, uh, my website is rohitbargava.com. Uh, and you'll find a subscribe uh, button on there to my newsletter. So every Thursday, I write a newsletter that's the most fascinating, diverse, interesting stories of the week, uh, along with a quick take on why they matter. Uh, it's called the Non-Obvious Insights Newsletter. And so if you just want someone's uh, take on the most interesting stories of the week and things that you might not have seen otherwise, uh, that's a great newsletter for you. So I definitely encourage you to subscribe to that. And that's pretty much where you'll learn about everything else that I've got. And I know you've got links up there for the book as well that we're, we've are we been talking about, nonobviousdiversity.com slash book, where you can get all the purchase links, but also straight from there, you can get links to watch the 50 videos from the summit, which is you know, more than uh, 50 hours of content uh, that you can watch as well as all the online resources and everything that we've been talking about and all that stuff's for free. So you don't have to pay anything. You can just go and check that out. We love free. Thank you so much, Rohit. We do, we do. Everyone loves free. Everyone. Right. Absolutely, right. absolutely. And Jennifer, how about you? Uh, so everybody I met, um, you can check us out. Jennifer Brown Consulting is our consulting company. It's part of our company, which is where we help uh, large and medium-sized companies with their DEI strategy and training. So if there's anything, any needs there, my team is incredible, as Brian knows well. Uh, and then Jennifer Brown Speaks is, is where I keep info on my books and podcasts, which is called The Will to Change. So please check that out. In fact, we'd love to re-air this as, a, as an episode, Brian, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and let's see what else. I'm in all the socials at Jennifer Brown on Twitter. Jennifer Brown speaks on Instagram. You'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, but I would just say, you know, join, get on our mailing list, particularly for calls like this, which we have monthly, the community calls, and also our webinar series, which is an educational webinar um, series that tackles different topics and centers different kinds of storytellers. So just get involved in our world, you know, join us, lots of free stuff, lots of um, you know, candid conversations um, and conversations I don't think you'll get anywhere else, particularly amongst the community of advocates that really care about these topics, but um, don't really have a safe place to kind of unpack them. And so I, I see that as my, my, perhaps my most important role um, and one that I enjoy a lot. So thanks, yeah. Brian. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and for anyone who is watching or listening and you don't know this, I, I got my start in the DEI consulting space with Jennifer Brown Consulting. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned a lot from Jennifer and her team. Uh, so we'll always be grateful for, for that opportunity. Um, and in the spirit of recognition, I also want to acknowledge, I'm, I thank you for acknowledging the question I asked you earlier as the first time you asked uh, that, I, that someone asked that. I should give credit to Mark Travis Rivera, who gave me that question. I'd love to say that I was really the brilliant yes. uh, source of that question, but it was <laughs> Mark. It was thank Mark. you, Mark. So, yeah. So Mark and Lindsay thank behind you. the scenes, thank you for, for helping bring this to life. Rohit and Jennifer, thank you so much for being with me today and being with all of us and sharing um, and for um, bringing your book Beyond Diversity to life so that we all can continue learning and growing together. Um, for all of you with us, thank you so much for being here. Um, I wish you um, a wonderful week ahead and stay safe and be well. We'll see you all soon. Bye, Bye everybody. Everyone. Thank you. Hi, thank you.